Welcome back, everybody, to this courageous conversation with the Reverend Charles Claycomb. We are so blessed that he is willing to share his experience. And so, Reverend Charles, you have named this series of dreams. I've been calling it Only a Glimpse, the dreams that delivered me to the face of God. And so, as presumptuous as that sounds, that's kind of the way I think upon these dreams upon my, in, within the context of my life. So. Because God was mysteriously at work. In Very much so. Another. That's the way I, th I think about them, truly. Yeah. So, Charles, for those who may be joining us for the first time, share the titles of the sessions that we've had so okay. far. Okay, I'll try to see if I can remember them. We, we actually started out with dream number one, which occurred in the, in the basement of my home, and I call it being attached. And I'm assuming people can actually go back and, of course, yes. tune in on any of these at any time they want. Being attached was the first. I was attached to this wooden box with green leaves at the bottom. And this, and this little strange little box communicated to me that I was going to be okay. I was going to recover from this horrible illness uh, so long as I remained attached to it. And then I always like to remind people that, yes, I was attached to, to a box or to boxes. I was on a ventilator for days and days as well as a renal dialysis machine. So in a sense, yes, I was attached to the box, but that box has, is full of, of profound symbolism and mystery and a sense of God's presence has always been associated with it for me. It's so incredible that you are willing to share because as we know, when people hear these kinds of experiences, if they've had anything similar, it gives them a sense of permission to share it and not feel strangely about their own personal experience. So thank you for your willingness to be a part of this series. Oh, so Reverend pleasure. Charles, yeah, thank you. So would you be willing to share the dream for today, please? All right, the name of the, the, name of the dream today is, and in some ways this is one of my favorite dreams of all of them, although, yeah, I really think this is one of my favorite. It's yeah. called A Beautiful Place. And uh, I think it'll be self-evident what I'm gonna what I'm gonna talk about. So, are you ready for Thank me? You, We're ready. Launch into this thing. All right. Well, as I have uh, have kind of shared with you in the dreams previously, uh, the first one I was all alone. I was in the basement. I was dealing with the, the with the box, and then I went into this blue house experience where I was sort of kept and 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 set aside and protected by probably a horrible assault of illness that, that, that got me back in the hospital in my dream state and, and with the assurance I was going to be okay. So in this dream today, uh, I, I thought maybe I might back up just a little bit if you're, if you're tuning in or if you don't remember all of the particulars about what I went through. It all began with a trip to the emergency room back on August the 6th, 2006. That's now almost 16 years ago. And after a perforation of my colon, about a year after treatment of, of surgery for colon cancer, I was immediately thrown into a very likely terminal condition known as septic shock. So all of my dreams were experienced literally between August the 6th and August the 22nd. I've easily been able, looking at my hospital charts, I know exactly when, within the context of these dreams. And so during this time, I was a patient uh, as at... Uh, at Wesley Medical Center inside the surgical intensive care unit up on the second floor of the, of the critical care building. And many of these dreams occurred while I was on a ventilator, obviously because I could not breathe on my own. And I might say, whenever you're on a ventilator, you're also within the isolation of not being able to uh, uh, talk to other people. People can talk to you, but you, you can't talk back. And if you're in a state of of heavy duty uh, medication, you may think, you know, I'm not even here. I may be dead. I, I may be in my coffin at my funeral. You get really confused at, at such a, as even without dreaming, you're, you're aware of that confusion. I was also on uh, continuing renal dialysis because of the sepsis and, and also my organs were failing. Long story short, I was in complete organ failure, save my brain and my heart. I will also tell you that I was on some very high dosages of morphine and a long list of other medications uh, during these early critical weeks. I had a physician actually one time uh, come to me and says, I think I know what kind of medication you were on. And, and so I showed him my, my chart information, had all of my medicines. 
he looked at it and he said, no, Charles, uh, that's not the medication I was expecting you to be on. So I don't have an explanation for how you might have been experiencing these dreams. He didn't have an answer for me. Um, but what makes these dreams so extraordinary from all other normal dreams is the fact that I have such clear recall of them now 16 years later. I also experienced them with a level of continuity uh, one does not normally have in dreams. They were dreams like I had never experienced before, nor have I ever experienced since. And I believe me, when I go to sleep at night, I, I dream with a new with a new sense of openness about what this dream might be like tonight. But no, I've never had one since. But more important, I have to affirm that these particular dreams were filled with great wisdom. Indeed, I, I have continued to learn from them even 16 years later as I've had chance to reflect upon them. But most important, I experienced each of the dreams to be a message to not only teach me something or show me something, uh, but to reassure me that, that I was going to be okay. And further, that I was in the absolute direct care and protection of what I believe to be you know, forces beyond me, heavenly powers is maybe the way I think about them. Indeed, it's my deep faith that the dreams were a gift from the very presence or face of God. So therefore, I, I stand before you today to declare uh, in, my, in the very bottom of my, my faith expression, God is good all the time. <laughs> I really believe that. No matter what we confront in life or in death, God is with us. I believe this experience is far too important not to share as a way to encourage others to hear the good news and accept God's love and care. So now let me share with you dream number four, the one I call a beautiful place. It opened with me resting in a small sailboat. I'm just sitting there in the, in the boat all by myself. I don't remember having any particular control of it. I, I don't remember attempting to steer it in any way. I was there for the ride and the wind, the gentle wind was deciding where I was going. And this gentle breeze brought me to the shores of this most beautiful city. It was full of what seemed like a brand new city. And yet, obviously, it, it looked kind of ancient and like uh, the architectural features were something way back there. But the truth is, it was all gleaming white and as new as new fallen snow. As the boat rested upon a beautiful sand beach, I recall getting out of it and walking toward this amazingly strange city. Now, this was the first time in all of my dreams, and this is important, <laughs> that I was able to walk. In all the other dreams, I, I just either floated in or, or was totally on a gurney or a bed, depended totally on others. And as I approached the various neighborhoods within the city, I saw that each house was open with no doors and all the windows were open. And the only thing that provided any sense of privacy was the fact that there was a white linen blowing in the wind. So, I mean, it was very, very open. <laughs> and uh, it was incredibly comfortable. There was no heat, no cold. It was just perfect. I remember selecting one of the first houses to come up, that I came upon, and I, I approached it, and, uh, and I was, to my amazement, I was welcomed by a woman who seemed to know me. I didn't know her, but she seemed to know me, and somehow seemed very familiar to me, like I should know her. She immediately welcomed me into her house and she set me down on a, on a lovely white velvet couch and handed me the, the most beautiful glass of cold iced tea. It just happened to be my favorite beverage. And after a bit, I was invited to go exploring into this gleaming city and to freely move from house to house. And it seemed that I was always welcomed in the very same way ultimate hospitality, and yet a sense that I was really home. I was being welcomed into my own house, my own home. There was no sense of private property. Everything was in common, and everyone there was both a welcoming host as well as a guest. I was received enthusiastically by people who knew me and seemed to expect me to be there. I felt as if I knew them, but I could not clearly identify who they were. 
I just had this awareness that I should know them, that they should be familiar to me. They were all gracious to me without exception. At the very center of the city dwelt this exceptionally beautiful and majestic building. It just seemed to shout out its own importance. I do remember that it was the only building that appeared to be locked. One could not gain access. I, I, I could walk up and I could touch it. I did. I touched the side of the building, but in no way did I, could I go in? And I suppose I was sort of no way did I want to go in because it just seemed too scary to me. I could just feel this deep sense of energy coming from it. And I felt like uh, uh, something horrible could happen to me if I did anything inappropriate in this place. I remember standing under the front porch and suddenly seeing my friend, my dear friend, my angelic friend from earlier dreams, my physical therapist who had, was a real person named George. He, he approached me and he just happened to be carrying this, this cardboard box in his, in his hands. And he was accompanied by some young people, like a, a, a group of a youth group from church or something. They were walking with him and, and they were also carrying boxes full of snacks candy and popcorn and things like that. And, and they were going to distribute these snacks during what they called the big show. It was, I mean, or the great show, the great show. And in fact, everything was gathered around this building and people were gathering. And it, it seemed like it was this grand temple with great power. And they were asking me if I had come this day to, to join them in watching the, the great show. I looked around and I could see people everywhere. They were on benches and they were lying on blankets and, and the beautiful, well-maintained grass was so obvious, all prepared to watch what was about to be this big production emanating from the very central temple itself. It was going to be like a kind of like a planetarium show. It was going to shine up on the sky. And they continue asking me, Charles, are you ready? Are you ready for the big show? And when I asked what the big show was, someone answered, Oh, it's wonderful. It's the time and it's the place where the majestic building at the center of the city will reveal all of the mysteries of God. It's also the time and the place when the universe will reveal all of its secrets. This moment is what all people wait a lifetime to experience for everything about everything and everything about everyone was going to be revealed. Hmm. I was told after that that I was, I was going to, uh, after everything was revealed to me, that I would be forever changed. In other words, it was, a, it was not only I, was I going to be privy to some amazing wisdom, but the fact that I got this wisdom, I would be forever transformed. Now, I didn't know quite what that meant. Suddenly, I had this terrible sense of distress and and a desire to go home. I was like Dorothy in the land of Oz, as majestic as this place was. It was a beautiful place. It was a perfect place. Perhaps I was in the very house of God. I, I was considering that possibility and everything about everything was gonna be revealed. And just as this majestic building was being powered up to start the show, I suddenly realized I had to get away. I mysteriously had this overwhelming feeling that everyone I loved was out there somewhere looking for me. It occurred to me that I was now a missing person. Uh, you know, back home, people were, were frantic. They, they wanted to know where I was. And I realized I had to act fast in order to get out of the city before the show began. And because I learned all that I was about to learn, they would never let me out of this perfect city. I, I, I was sort of... It was just, I couldn't do that. But no, I couldn't stay. I, I had to go back. I had to go home. I had to get back to the boat. I had to sail home before I broke Martha's heart. Martha's my wife. I was going to break her heart. I could just sense her out there in the world crying, you know, like Dorothy's grandmother. You know, it was that kind of moment. And I could also hear the cries of my own children. They were crying. They were wanting to know where I was. There was never a question that this was a beautiful place, and I knew that I belonged there, and I knew that I want to return to it, but the timing was all wrong. I kept saying to everyone I encountered, I got to go back. I got to go back. I got to go home, and I specifically remember going up to George. Remember George in this box and, and his boxes, and he offers me this snack, and, and, and I say to him, I, I can't take this. I got to go. I got to leave now. And I remember George winking at me, as only George would, just this little 
mischievous wink. And he said, Charles, don't you know, you're in the hospital. <laughs> and I remember being furious at him. How could he say such a thing? Look around, man. Not only was I not in the hospital, I was far from the hospital as I could possibly be. And I began to run out of the center, out of the center of the city. All I knew was I had to get out of there before that show started. And because I knew in my heart, I was about to see the splendor of God. And if I saw the splendor of God, I would never be able to leave, or I suppose I would never want to leave. And yet I had another fear. If I walked away or, or sailed away, would I ever get another chance to return to this amazing place? That was a perplexing problem. What a dilemma. Was I, to, was I to stay in paradise in, and even get a chance to see God or, or go back to Wichita, Kansas with all of its illness and uncertainty? But yet I knew I was, it was the home where all of the people I love dwelt. I, I wanted to go home. So I rushed away from the great gathering into the shelter of the first house that I arrived. Remember the, the house where I got that iced tea? <laughs> And I was exhausted. I just collapsed on that beautiful velvet couch. And I didn't, I knew there was no way I, I couldn't get on a boat. I didn't know how to sail a boat. I didn't know how to get home. But I just lay there alone all by myself. And I looked up and I saw tacked on the wall of this house, a snapshot photo, a black and white picture of my maternal grandmother with her arms wrapped around my sister and myself. I just have one sibling. She had her arms wrapped around the two of us when we were both very, very young children. And as I lay there, I allowed my eyes to focus on that little picture, obviously on the wall of my dear grandmother's heavenly home. Hmm. And everything was transformed before me into the physical walls of SICU. It just <laughs> evaporated and I was back in the hospital. But I was back. And this very picture, which was posted on my hospital room, was left there by a visiting cousin who came to visit me. <laughs> and it became my vehicle back to the earth. Yet I'll always know that somewhere another community awaits for me. A beautiful place found in my fondest dreams. You can only imagine how often I wonder about that beautiful place, a paradise that we can only dream about or perhaps hope for. It was a place of perfect peace, perfect peace. It was a place of total equality. You know, nothing was owned by anybody. It was all owned in common. It was a place where I was all set to learn pure and complete wisdom. But I walked away, and I was not yet ready to see the face of God or enjoy the, the glory of the divine show, or perhaps they were not ready for me. <laughs> Something was left undone. I had to go home. Now, still, I feel comfortable in my dream because uh, I know that it's still waiting there for me, <laughs> not just for me, it's waiting there for every one of us because that's a big place and there's plenty of room for everybody. It's a world away from all human strife as we know it here. It's a place of absolute perfect peace, or as the Hebrews say, perfect shalom. The answer to all our questions of the universe and beyond are truly forthcoming as surely as God is eager to reveal them to us. And I rejoice because the big show is coming soon. Now, looking back on that dream, and that's about how it ended, I, I, could, I could sort of kick myself because when I got over to dream six that you'll hear about later, I'm given a test. I'm actually given an examination and it's all about the questions of the universe. And if I, would have, if I would have stuck around and listened to that lecture or that big show or whatever it was, I would have had the answers to those horrible questions that I got in dream six that you'll hear about in the future. But no, I ran away and I skipped class. But I'm here in this moment merely to tell you a, 
a profound story of the love of God. Jesus promised that he would build us a house with plenty of rooms. And this house will be built with, not with human hands, but rather eternal in the heavens. No beginning, no end. But the house of God and the, and the new Jerusalem is also spoken of way back in the pages of the Hebrew Bible through the words of the, pro, of the prophet Isaiah. When he said, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that he may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and they shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. That's Isaiah chapter 2. Was the vision of my dream the very promise of God provided by the labor of our Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, I believe it is. But I also want to affirm at this moment that I will always believe that God is doing great things, amazing things, wonderful things. And may I also add that each one of us should see ourselves as being included, as being included and welcomed into all the great things that God is doing. Thanks be to God. Amen. And Jeff, that's the end of this dream. Wow. I'm just so profoundly moved by these dreams. And even though it's a personal encounter for you, I find myself with you in these dreams. Thank you. I, I hope so. I hope so. So thank you again, Reverend Charles. And for those of you who are watching, I want to remind you, we're going to have a debriefing session whereby you can share your questions and experiences. It'll be a great time of conversation at the end of this series. So until next time, God be with you. And thank you again, Reverend Charles, and for also, your willingness to be vulnerable for the you, sake of helping all of us experience that wonder of God's goodness and grace. And may God be also be with all of you. Thank you so much. Amen. All right, folks, be sure to tune in for the next dream. God bless. Well done. <laughs> Extremely well done. Okay.